Welcome back, horror fiends, to another edition of the Week in Horror Front Row, where we sit down with the incredibly talented individuals who shed their blood to make this genre the greatest of them all. Tonight, we have a very special guest on the front row for you. He's a writer, he's a director, an actor, and a producer with over 230 projects under his belt. He is obsessed with that greatest decade ever, the 80s, and all effects that are practical. And on top of that, he is not only our first returning guest, but he had the dubious honor of being the very first industry guest we ever had on the show all the way back in season one. We give a huge, gory welcome back to Matthew Mark Hunter. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. How have you been? I am good. I am fucking tired is what I have because we were just saying before we before we started recording, the work never ends. It never does, you know? And yeah, the whole point, when I, I'll tell you this. This is, this is awesome. You know, I love this for the audience there because Matthew is familiar with the show already. He knows what we do. So we don't have to go through like the whole rigmarole. And if you are interested in hearing like uh, what we knew about Matthew back in 2019, but back in 2019, you had like, you were like, you were about to break a hundred projects, right? Yeah, something around there, yeah. Okay, so 100 projects 2019, close to 100 projects 2019, over 230 less than five years later, cranking them out like a fucking machine. Okay, and there's stories there. There's stuff there. We're going to dive into it. But if you, listener out there, haven't uh, checked that out, go all the way back to season one of Week in Horror. You can hear our very first interview with Matthew Mark Hunter right there. It's like, literally, I think it was like December of 2019. You can go back and listen to that. So, but we started this podcast for like industry professionals to like have a place where they could be fans and to kind of like, you know, let's remember why we love the genre, why we do this work. And then the podcast led to stuff. And now all of a sudden, like, you know, there's not, now all of a sudden we're having trouble being fans. <laughs> so it's kind of, it was like a double-edged sword, but you have had, since you came on last 2019, since we saw you last and I've been following you on social media, you have had a stellar fucking run, dude. Your rocket is the sky, we said the sky was the limit back then. We knew it. The dedication that you have and the love that you have for the genre, okay, and your vision. And man, did you did you expect this? I mean, it was a goal, but did, did you really anticipate it? Um, I mean, we knew we were gonna get probably to two hundred sometime. Um, now it's just working up to three hundred films and so on and so on, depending on how many we can actually crank out. Um, I mean, we lost a lot of original people due to things. But we've gained a lot of better people involved with MMH, um, which is always great to have better, newer people. Um, so it's just been a lot of stuff throughout many things going on, creating bigger stuff. And it's just been great. I've seen the posters that you have coming out, and I love how increasingly elaborate things are becoming as you've really got these things under your belt. And you're getting more and more familiar with your technique and you're learning new techniques and embracing New stuff as it comes along. It's like, I want to try this. I want to try this. I want to do this. It's like the dude who's never satisfied at the salad bar, man. He's got to try every little thing. And that is one of those great hallmarks. You know, it's like, oh, we, we, we haven't done this. Let's try this new thing. Or, or, or you do something as well. I've noticed you've been writing up. You've been writing up a storm. Is there a moment, other than this moment right here, is there a moment, you're, is this the first break you've gotten writing? Um, I know <laughs> the, the last four weekends we've been filming every weekend. So this is actually the first weekend i've had a little bit of relaxing to get some editing stuff done for the film and then they work just called and said they don't need me to come in tomorrow which is even better for a full weekend off to actually get more stuff done but um i mean even with the writing the horror stuff we're slowly getting back into writing the kids show specials getting back into that which which after this year and the like five projects of horror we're going to be ending up doing we're actually going to be doing probably like one horror film next year and i want to focus all 2025 to like kids genre stuff for the year and then just to take a little breather but i'll still do like one or two things but not as much as i've been doing nonstop. i i've got to ask because we know that you have a love of 80s a love of the 80s a love of the exploitation genre and all the little sub genres that are within there and we, we your vision has always been so inspired I've I've always been curious. What inspired the jump to go into 
kids into kids media into children's media because that because you can see one mentality there but what kind of led to that what was that uh journey um it started in like during the we really got going during when covid was hitting um but i've always wanted to do something with kids because again all the horror films i do most of them have child actors involved in some way or form and we even brought some of the kids who were in the horror films to be voices of different characters in the kids show we went doing. But I've always, even with all the horror films I've watched, I also have always only watched like kids content throughout my life. Um, so the kids show is kind of like a Mr. Roger Sesame Street kind of vibe. And when we had the first episode come out, we had a lot of negative feedback from um, parents just because once you type the kids show in on IMDb, all you see is all the horror stuff. <laughs> and a lot of them are thinking like, are you going to try to make horror into the children? Like you trying to influence them into horror, but none of them even watched what the show was about. And the show has like zero horror at all. It's like G rated. We're actually like reading a books, telling lessons. We did one like explaining, um, divorce to kids dealing with death of a family member um some other hard topics and we go to like learning about crickets and things like that or like taking turns and stuff every episode um but even with all the negative feedback again i really didn't care because all the kids who were in the kids show were also in all the horror films so even then it's still everything's coming full circle again with everyone um but even with the, that i was like i'm still gonna do it i really don't matter to me um then we did like a spooky story time kids show with like uh like a little bit of scarier books kind of like goosebumps ish style and we had like different puppet characters like a raven and things and then we just this weekend released a third kid show about like a wild west kid show with a cowboy and a sheriff dog and then we're slowly we had like two more episodes coming out we just finished but the other stuff's all been we have episodes we just have no time to edit anything with all the other horror uh. stuff so that's why they're, I have them all done, a lot of episodes. It's just I have no time for editing with the film horror stuff, um, doing um, commercial stuff for other people, for payments, of course, and then also just working a regular job, too. Yes, trying to try trying to make ends meet is the co is the constant struggle because the amount that goes into making it, <clears throat> you almost like you get lucky if you break even, you know, because. Oh, oh, yeah, just, exactly. Yeah, because even the kids show, when we started, I told everyone, we're going to make zero dollars on this YouTube kids. You know, we're not going to expect any money at all. This is just for us to do for fun, which, of course, everyone understood that who were like the main voices. And everyone was like, I told everyone, like, this is going to go on YouTube kids. We'll probably get like 100, 200 views if that, which, again, we still have that many. But I wasn't too worried about the views is more of a thing for me to do. And the people who do watch it, at least it's something out there. And then even for like, I can put it on my resume, like, Hey, I can do more than just horror. I love that. And I, I, I saw that you've been, you've been branching out, which I really, really dig. That's that, you know, that, that hunger to try and, you know, take on new stuff and challenge yourself with new things. I dig this. The, uh, the, the little special you're referring to was the cowboy Jim and Benny's wild west show. Yeah, that's the so, new one we just released. Very, very cool. Very cool. And hopefully we'll, you know, uh, editing is, is always so time consuming. I myself, when I do my, when I do my, because I have my YouTube, my personal YouTube channel as well. And editing is always the lion's share. You know, I'm trying to do like a 30 minute or a 20 to 30 minute video. And I'm in the editing suite for like, you know, six, seven hours to get that done. And I'm just, you know, fast and furious with, you know, dropping all the effects and shit. So it definitely takes a toll. I can understand that. Now, you brought up something interesting, and I was always curious about this. I love checking in with y'all because obviously, obviously, since the last time you were on the show, two major things happened, like two big things that affected the industry. The first was the fucking pandemic. The second was the fucking strike. So I noticed that because you mentioned that during the pandemic. So did did you stall did 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 you find that that situation kind of stalled you or was was that an opportunity uh, that you were able to seize and grow during that? We did not care. As though, <laughs> so we had a film shoot planned, and it was a zombie film, and it was probably like twenty ish, twenty or more people in this 
small house we were filming at. So not and only was, did you get it, it was inspired. It was inspiration is what it was. Yeah, it was like, you know what? I'm not even gonna worry about it. We already had this set up. It was a week before the actual stuff where it was like locked down, like no one can leave. It was like a week before that. And we were just we still shot the zombie film. I mean, people are like, everyone's like touching on each other, like people are getting bitten stuff. And luckily, all the filming we did throughout the COVID years, because we never stopped, no one in the cast and crew ever got corona, which is another great thing. Cause again, I wasn't someone who was like, you have to be um you have to have the shot to be in the film. You know, I don't care. You can either have it, don't have it. I really don't care. You're in the film. And everyone who knew was like, we're going to have people who don't have the vaccine, just so you know. And they were okay with it. Because it's like, I'm not going to have someone not be in one of my horror films just for that little reason. But then we did do, I did it, uh, the two years that really happened was like a um, lockdown seven film. And I just did seven films, one every weekend just by myself acting about a different topic. And I had people send in voiceovers. So that was about seven weeks, one year, seven weeks, the next year we did that. So 14 films within 14, for 14 weeks. Um, we just had people send in voiceover and thing like that. But then we did like the short films we did. We had like maybe two or three cast members, but we really didn't slow down at all during Corona at all. It wasn't a big thing to me. And uh, being independent, uh, did the strike affect you at all, or did you run into issues with that? Because we saw while we're doing the pod, while the podcast is kind of like outside of that, we have we we saw rumblings uh, not only from the professional, from like the union side, but also the independent side as well. Because there were independent artists that are not signed that were like picking up gigs, and so we saw rumblings that way. Did uh, did that affect y'all or affect MMH in any way? Um, not at all. Like, honest, if I'm being honest about that, I don't even know when it started or when it even ended because we still had like the same cast people show up for the shooting, you know, the same group of actors and stuff. And we even had a few new people show up here and there. But because we're like, you know, I don't really do SAG actors. It's all non-union stuff. It's all indie, whatever. Um, we just had the same it was like nothing even really changed for us. We just kept doing the usual horror films left and right. New people came in, had the same makeup and actors. We didn't get like, of course, we don't have like B list names either. You know, it's just all local actors in the area. So no one really stopped acting that I know of who I had on set because everyone I try to get in my films was just not even worried about it because it's like, Okay, Hollywood, I don't even care. Independent, <laughs> home, I mean, we don't even have that kind of deal where act because, again, like it's a non paid thing either. Like a lot of the actors don't get paid, but I don't get paid doing anything either. Um, and I don't make any money on half the stuff. Um, so again, it's just like we just did it to do it. We're not Hollywood, and I really don't care about Hollywood views. I mean, people when they had like the writer strike. I was like, I'll volunteer and I'll write whatever you want from home. You know, just hire me and I'll write for cheap. Yeah, you know, I just anything to get some kind of like out there income. I just wasn't worried about it. And then luckily everything, I guess, went OK. But nothing really changed that way with us. We were more COVID was more of a bigger thing for us than the other one. Awesome. Awesome. See, and he's like, when you're too busy making stuff, you got no time to pay, you know, no time to pay attention to the nonsense that's going on oh, no, outside yeah, of that. Yeah. yeah. I don't even watch too, the news. Too busy, too busy, too busy making awesome shit. All right. So there's, I noted while I was, while I was following you on social media and we always, we think this is always amazing stuff because I love hearing about, uh, people working in this industry finally kind of like breaking through <clears throat> and because we mentioned, you know, Hollywood dealing with independent film, dealing with like, you know, you know, bigger budget stuff and, you know, making their way. But you broke through in between from 2019 to here. Tell me about Full Moon and Troma. Um, because we yeah. heard about that and we lost our shit. We're <laughs> like, oh, the dude who was who was putting together short films, 100 short films. You know, at from the age of 17, just cranking out short films. Like, man, he's got a future. And then we saw that shit arrive. Tell me about that, man. 
I was, I was, my two favorite like inspirations for making movies, of course, is Full Moon with everything like puppets and dolls coming to life because I do that all the time. And then also the trauma side, I always love with like cough and like the, um, the gore splatter practical, you know, just like goofy type of shit. Um, and then luckily we got 10 of the movies on trauma now streaming. And Lloyd Kaufman is going to be in our his third MMH film for Air Fryer Slaughter and in Pool Shark Toy Frenzy. And then we, I also, this past year, was on a full moon film set in Cleveland, uh, Bad CGI Gator, where I did a special effects makeup with my buddy on for that one and just behind the scenes stuff. So I was able to get two things off my goal list is work somewhere with trauma somehow and with full moon. So my name's in a full moon film, and then I got trauma my stuff on trauma. So it was a win win for those things. How how did that transition? I you gotta do you gotta let you, you know, walk me through it. How did that transition happen? I mean, I don't think it was like Lloyd like like called you up one day. It was like, hey, it's like it's just going. It's, I know how Lloyd should say like this. Um, but how did that transition occur? Um well, Lloyd Kaufman, I tried to get for our Nightmares Unleashed uh, feature film uh, remake I wanted to do. It was a short that I turned into a feature, and I tried contacting him for like a year and a year and a half to get him involved. And every email I got from like other filmmakers who had him involved and online, nothing happened. And I finally, I met, I've seen him at a horror convention here and there, um, just like as a fan to sign stuff. And then the one year I went after all that, I straight up, I was like, Mr. Uh, Lloyd Kaufman, I've been trying to reach you with these emails, but I haven't gotten anything back. He asked what emails they were. They said the one guy he quit, he fired, and the other emails was not right. So he gave me his personal business card with his name, number, email on it. He said, like, reach out to me this way, and we'll get the filming done. And we did get all his footage for Nightmares Unleashed. Um, I emailed him again recently to do, uh, like, a bunch of different lines from home for, like, remote stuff and voiceover stuff to use in like three or four more future films down the line so i could say he's been in like not recently but soon he'll be in like seven eight mmh films at some point because i'm having him do I'm, we're doing a bunch of stuff all at once and i can just use various things here and there and then i know full moon opened a house they bought an area in cleveland and then like they bought a house for the actors to stay in and they've been doing like a bunch of filming over here and i've been trying to get involved with them for like i met one of the guys at the horror another horror convention i was like hey here's my um dvd of some of my best stuff i've done a lot of the stuff's all like puppet movements you know that's my favorite thing to do is that production design all kinds of things to life i gave one to charles band himself also nice but luckily um the only way i got onto that is my makeup artist ron george who's done like a bunch of stuff with us. He was going to be a makeup artist on bad CGI Gator. And luckily he was able to ask if he can bring in a, um, an assistant to help him. So I was, I got, so he invited me and I was his like assistant special effects and makeup artist on set. And, um, you know, it was, it was fun to do it. Fun to do all this stuff. I just mostly wanted to see like behind this stuff. And I even said, yeah, I'm not even worried about getting paid for this. You know, don't even worry about that. And I knew it wasn't going to happen because I wasn't like an actual like crew member at the time. Hey, don't worry about me. I'm just I know. Here for the I'm, I'm just here for the craft services. And then, and then luckily <laughs> they, they were like, we're going to send you a box of just full moon stuff as a thank you, which again is even a better win for me because Holy shit. I got a bunch of full moon as it is. And they're like, well, what stuff don't you have? And I was like, I don't got this replica. I don't got this or that. And then like a two or three weeks later, they sent me a, like two shipments boxes of stuff. And I was like, well, that works for me. And I told him the last day of that film shoot, like everyone's going home, like we're just cleaning up and stuff. And I wanted to not leave until everyone else was gone. So I stayed like four or five extra hours that last night cleaning up, um, putting, loading their stuff up, you know, talking to them and things. And I, they were like, if we ever come back to the area to do more stuff, which is doing this year to just like keep my name locked in and I'll just be happy to come back anytime. I told him I'll call off work. You know, this is way more important to me. Um, and then even with cleaning everything up and helping them, 
I was able to take a bunch of stuff home from the set prop wise. I was using the film. Nice. I got like three cases of beer bottles from the set. I got like a ping pong ball from the stuff. Like I, they gave me, I got a bunch of stuff from the shooting, which was sweet. But when the film came out, the best part was just seeing my name in the credits. That was like the greatest moment. Oh, it always feels good. That really does. It does. I remember um, because it, it, the, the, you got to work that you got to 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 jump into that break into that because a few months ago we recently we recently covered a movie called Bleed that was a uh, the Charles Band was behind but it was under the it wasn't under Full Moon because Full Moon yeah was yeah yeah movie. yeah so but we covered that and and it starred Lloyd Kaufman and Kaufman was in it so I was like oh sweet we got to see the two of them together and getting to talk to you and knowing that you that you that you that you finally broke through you got that that opportunity. That you'd have managed to establish yourself enough in order to be like, hey, let's bring him in, you know, at least give him that shot to, you know, to, to kind of like look behind and see what's going on. And we were just so ecstatic when we heard that for you, how you broke into that. Um, man, oh man, that's that was the wildest thing. That journey is is amazing. So you you've talked a bit and you've mentioned a bit because this this because this has got my attention. You wrote and you directed it, starring Lloyd Kaufman. Okay, Air Fryer Slaughter is the is the is the current from what I've seen here is the current big thing that you've got where you're working on, right? Yeah, we we had Nightmares Unleashed just wrapped, which was like our big big right. film, and then that's just in post production still. Um, but once we announced like the Air Fryer Slaughter, I because of Matt, we have to thank Max Skinner really for the support we got because like. Numbers Unleashed was like my big baby. We raised like six hundred dollars in funds, In that film I probably spent a couple grand on my own pocket just to create it. And then we bring Air Fryer Slaughter in, and luckily we hit uh, over five thousand on it, thanks to Matt Skinner. But then we also were able to get Lloyd Kaufman, uh, Jessa Flux, Angel Bradford, Mel Kiflin, uh, Morgan, uh, Malam. Um, Claire Bacon, Heather Harlow. Um, we made sure we got like a bunch of people uh, in the indie scene involved for that one. And that one's a really like shot on video. Um, we have, we posted like a face melting kill, which is really like impressive because I told them if we can't do a kill practical, I'm not doing the kill in the film. And nice. then like the film that, the one kill that's one of my favorites that I can't even show because I'm trying to surprise it and stuff. Yeah. It's, um, we're calling it the air fryer eating out thing with um, a female and it's probably one of the most it's very gory with how we did it too but it's really nasty gnarly um, stuff for that one where air fryer slaughter is most likely a slasher gore fest thing coming to life thing <clears throat> and then like on the other side for Nightmares Unleashed it's more of my um, horror fantasy film with like we use like we actually had crew, we had black magic camera, like a lot of heavy stuff. And then we're doing air fryer now with just like the VHS camcorder shooting on video, VCR editing, um, a bunch of other fun random stuff. And we just, the last four weekends have been filming air fryer slaughter. And we only have two shoots left for that one, thankfully. Um, and then that one I'm probably going to release um, to like establish a big, bigger like name for like mmh because i know more people are interested in that and then drop nightmares unleashed because we're going to be filming part two this summer also for nightmares unleashed um and just hopefully those two things when they come out with killer poop too when that comes out i mean there's gonna be three <laughs> big ones that are coming out at once i love that i like because because you've got because uh, i noticed that you got it in pre-production right now so you guys, the Amityville, the Amityville, like, because it's Amityville Poop, Killer Poop 2, which I, I love that you tagged on the Amityville deal. And then already, and then Killer Poop 3, which is going to be great. But then I've noticed, and, uh, you've already in pre-production with, with Nightmares Unleashed 2, Raven's Return, which I think is, if I think it's going to go where I think it's going to go, then, you know, given, given how, given your setup on the first one, on Nightmares Unleashed, given what the information that you have available there, I, I think you have something really, really solid there. I do. And I hope, man, fingers crossed, air, air fryer slaughter. Just fuck. Because the, the premise is insane. And it's just so trauma. It's so, it's so yeah, it's, vision. And I cannot so, wait to see it. It's, it's very invokes, naughty. 
it invokes, you know, 300 pound fat man being eaten by an escalator, yeah. you know, and just like it, you know, for those out there who know that we know what that reference is from, I'll let you sort it out, but it's amazing that you've gotten this. So, you know, you know, now that the truck is now that the, the, the train has left the station and you're trucking along and now these things are happening here, I, I've got, I've got to know, like, do you have you set your like? Do you, have you set yourself any like yo know, big goals like any individuals you want to work with or as like now that now that you, I mean Lloyd and Charles you got Lloyd you know Lloyd you know you direct you're directing him solid you know and then but anybody after that or for Nightmares Unleashed I did email three to four people I wanted involved with it um two of them we didn't we heard like one email back and then we didn't hear anything back from um we try to get mike tobacco from killer clowns from outer space to be uh raven's dad nice. um we tried era heaton from number Street three to be the dad um but we are emailing him still and we might give him to be a voiceover in part two um and then the other main person we reached out to for nightmares was phil fandakaro um from like ghoulies 2 and all those other great films and we have the email and phone number for him. Um, we didn't get him in part one, but I'm gonna re-email and uh, text back out to be another to be a voiceover in part two for that one, because he's one of my favorite actors. And when I met him at a horror convention, we probably talked. I talked his ear off for probably like 40 minutes back and forth questionings, and and then I I even gave him the script for Nightmares Unleashed. Um, so he had that. He read it. Um, we were eat, talking back and forth. You know, it was just like a lot of things were happening. So we just waited for that one still. But if I can get um, that in part two and then um, Ira Heaton from Nightmare Machine 3 2 be in Nightmares 2, um, those are like the next two I really want to get involved. But then I've had, um, I mean, it's just like those are like, I can't really think too, too much about who I'd like to get involved. But I know once we get, um, because we did get, we did almost get, um, well, we did have uh, Victoria De May from the Killjoy series. She played Betty Boo. And she was going to be in Killer Poop 3 as a voice of one of the clown poops. Uh, we got her contract. We sent her the money. But the last time we emailed her, she still hasn't sent any of her voice stuff over. So we really got to start asking her again, like, are you going to send the stuff or how are we going to do this? Because <laughs> she already signed the contract and stuff, too. Um, so we got to uh, get on that again, too, for that one. But it's just I want to see if I can even get uh, like a cameo voice role from just Charles Band himself in something, nice. which would be pretty sweet. But I, I, I'm not setting my things too high for that one. But again, it's just doing what we're doing now, um, seeing what happens with Air Fryer. Hopefully that and Nightmares Unleashed, when those both come out, it'll actually be more of a jump for myself to actually prove myself better especially with nightmares with how many like monsters and practical effect monsters are in that one um hopefully those two films are really like breakthroughs for the company nice very cool any uh, i got so and now that now that you know kind of like this i said the sky's the limit and now you're kind of like out there any icons you hope to maybe get because i've, I've discovered that in pre-production stuff like this, we found out that some icons are a hell of a lot easier to get than you'd think that they that they were. And so I'm kind of curious, any icons that you might want to work with one day? Kind of like, you know. Um, again, I still want to try to get Phil involved. And then I wanted to reach out to like um, Mark Togel for, uh, from Toxic Avenger. Um, see if he'd be interested in something. Um try again like mike tobacco and things like that from killer clowns and i really i actually reached out to um oh, i can't think of his name off the top of my head but my favorite horror film is the willies and i reached out to the um the guy who played the fly boy nice uh, and he has a lot of stuff with sag going on so he couldn't come out to the like he 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 sent me an email back saying he can't do it because of sag and things like that which was upsetting but Anyone from like the Willies, I'd like to get involved just to have them involved because that's again like the film that made me want to be a filmmaker. Um, I don't know too many like big like names I like too too crazy about, 
um because again i'm more about the like the lower budget style actors and things like that uh, but again the main one would be phil for sure nice see i because i know because i because just just from from putting feelers out ourselves here at week in horror we know that uh as long as you can pay doesn't matter what the project is you can get danny trejo you can get oh, yeah, Otter, yeah. you yeah. can get felissa rose it's like as long as the check clears you got yourself an icon and so that kind of like really that, that that's possible it yeah. won't be like um i don't see kane yeah. i was like kane hotters be like yes I, I was jason four times let me read the script oh this script has nothing for me i'm not doing this it's like no you, 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 the check clears. You got Kane Hodder on set. Money is like, money, I, I, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know Felicia Rose does a lot of indie stuff too. Uh huh. A lot of stuff. We, uh, several of our, there. several, I think our last three guests here on Front Row have had Felicia Rose in their, in, in a production that they did. Wow. So I was like, I was like, wow, she, she cranks it out. And that, yeah. girl, that girl is on fucking stock. Yeah. And I've seen Danny Trejo in some dollar store horror films I picked up. And <laughs> some of those are really rough to watch. It's like I see Danny's on the cover, but man, this film is not a great film to watch. Like I cannot, get, <laughs> I cannot watch this indie horror film. The I think we we actually covered one of them. It was called uh, Lava Zombies. I think is what it was, or like Volcano Zombies. I think is what it was. Basically, it's like this 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 volcano erupted and released these ancient spirits, and Danny Trejo just happened to be there. I don't know. It's like we weren't I mean, sure what was going on. But he, yeah, like he'll do it. He will. He, it's amazing stuff, dude. This is this is freaking cool. Now you did. Me- I found this. Uh, you mentioned Ghoulies, and it just popped into my head. And I, I got. We got word from uh, from Bloody Disgusting that Ghoulies is being rebooted. And I was like, holy shit! They're gonna because we that'd be this Ghoulies, Ghoulies two, Ghoulies back to school, and then and then uh, the Ghoulies four. That the the franchise kind of like petered out, you know. There's a lot of replicas. Yeah, everybody knows it's a gremlin. It was kind of a gremlin's rip. So, it can, but it, it, four films, not too bad. And still, it's puppets and practical effects, which is a lot of fun. Yeah. But being rebooted for for uh, the next generation, you know, it's like bringing it for the for the new for the uh, for the new. I guess for the millennial style. I'm not 100 percent sure, but that got me wondering with your love for 80s, for the 80s, with your love for practical effects, you know. Fuck CGI, feel like that. If they, if you know if they, if they don't have to wash the blood off, then what's the fucking point? Yeah, I'm curious. He's like, with news like that coming down, and I've noticed this is coming a lot. You know, the industry re you know, the industry tapping, you know, franchises from the '70s, you know, films films and franchises from the '70s, and the '80s. What's your kind of view on the state of horror at this point? When you're keeping it as real as possible, where you are, I would say just to start about the ghoulies thing that Mm -hmm. ghoulies 2 is one of my like top films um i love the rat ghoulie and the uh the bat one i love the i love the carnival setting like there oh yeah uh, yeah. oh it was was freaking fantastic not to mention um oh i don't i don't want to i don't want to mess it up because his his um the uh Oh, I I never want to screw up his name. Sorry, Phil Fondacaro. Phil Fondacaro. Yeah, yeah, love that's him. What I'm talking about, that's yeah, Phil, he's amazing. Stuff. So yeah. lo- love that. Uh, yeah, that's one I've reached out to for a few times yeah. for things like that. But yeah, as long as they reboot the, because I know it's the original people. I mean, as long as they still do puppets in some aspect of the Ghoulies and not just CGI monsters, I think it'll be awesome. I know they're talking about Killer Clown Smart of Space Two. And hopefully that's practical clowns again, not CGI oh, it should clown. Be. Yeah, it should it better be. be. <laughs> then it's just like okay, okay, but even um, if it's even if it's practical clowns with sprite animation effects, it fucking works because that's what worked yeah. in the first films. So. Oh yeah, you just gotta have them actually in costumes and masks, and it'll be perfect. But like, there's just so many films that are being like rebooted, remade. Um, I know the Crow one's a big one. People are talking about. Um, the Toxic Avenger reboot they were talking about with Peter Dinklage. Um, they're redoing The Lost Boys coming up. Um, I mean, there's just so many that's like a street trash, I think, is getting one also, which is actually cool oh. because a lot of it's like, all right, street trash, all right, that can get a reboot, you know what I mean? Because there's a lot of stuff you could change and make better for that one. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, Stuff like Lost Boys and things. I mean, it's just so hard to even why even reboot it instead of just coming up with a different vampire idea. 
we were we were thinking yeah. that with when they, with with Blumhouse when they with uh not to not to throw Blumhouse under the bus. We love Blumhouse and we love Jason Blum and everything he does, but with Firestarter, with the Firestarter remake that came out, and it was like, why would you do that? And then of course we heard there was a proposed Christine remake. I was like, no. Yeah, no. I mean, no. <laughs> if people want to just instead of like saying, say for example, like the crow and stuff, but like rebooting and stuff, just re-release it into theaters for the new generation. Reshow the original trailer for all these films, like just drop the old Crow trailer, drop the Lost Boys trailer from the '80s. Even if you make it a 4K to advance the quality of it too for the new generation, at least show the old at theaters instead of just remaking everything. Because that's just—I mean, it's just there's so many. For an example, you can use me for example. Indie filmmakers who have projects that are not like Hollywood stuff. You give them each indie filmmaker a hundred grand, you'll make they'll make you five films easily. It's just like we need different ideas than just rebooting everything, right? Even though I'm remaking nightmares from a short, but that's a short film into a feature, so it's a lot different. Um, but again, like I want to see the Toxic Avenger one to see what they do because I don't think they can go as much um, hard R blood and gore nowadays like they could back in the day. Um, for like when I see like um, PG thirteen horror films, it's like I just want to see the people die. Like the Five Nights at Freddy's film, I wish they actually showed blood and stuff of people dying, not just fading away from it. Um, a lot of the other films that are PG thirteen horror, I just want to see the kills and I want to see like the blood and stuff happening. I don't want to just see like feet kicking and like um fake. And just fitting out the black with music and screaming. I just want to actually horror films should start getting back to that R rating. Like when Thanksgiving came out by Eli Roth, I mean that was like that was really good for like horror yes. film gore and bringing R rated horror back. So I wish, I hope R rated horror comes back more. But even as a general note, I hate the MPAA rating system. I mean it's all a bunch of bull crap. Um, it's just a bunch of people who are deciding it themselves because like even if you go back to films from like the 80s that are rated pg they would not be rated pg today right because we're in it but i mean i think a lot of it's just over exaggerating the mpaa stuff because there was like someone posting about like how the crow trailer should have had a red band trailer because how gruesome it was and it's like it's gruesome I mean, it's like these i mean people... guys <laughs> these people I even like, watch horror <laughs> it's like guys i mean I, I the main the main camera I always say is the MPA is the most stupidest thing that they keep changing and just like the YouTube guidelines for how YouTube is changing so much crap with um demonetizing and making everything 18 plus content when it's even not like I know the air fryer teaser we dropped today two seconds later YouTube flagged it already um, other stuff YouTube totally flagged and told me to remove it which I had to do. So it's just like I put a rating on there that says 18 and older. You don't got to turn it all the way off. Like, I mean, it's not my fault kids are looking this crap up. You know, that ain't my problem. It's, I was raised where parents watched, let me watch horror films as a kid. If I got scared, it showed the behind the scene footage, someone's in makeup. You know, this is fake. It's an actor. If parents would just say, this stuff is fake, you can see there's just behind the scenes footage. Like, that monster is not real, guys. It's obviously CGI made. So, I mean, if parents were not so... If parents would just sh explain to their kids better, like this stuff's fake, and not be scared to show them stuff, I mean, it's not even a big deal, in a sense. Sure, nudity, close your eyes, you know, turn away, stuff like that. Nudity, you can hold off to they're a little older if you want. Me, I had to just close my eyes without watching. But for <laughs> stuff, my parents didn't care. I mean, it's not gonna. It didn't make me a serial killer, like they always say. Video games make me shoot people. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I make horror films, but I don't actually kill anyone in the films. But it's the same way. It's just like if someone's gonna watch something, they're gonna find it and watch it anyway. There's no stopping it. The way kids are these days at school alone, they say worse stuff than I do in my own films. So it really doesn't even matter in that sense either. I See, hear there's kids truth to it. There's, there's truth to it. Movies yeah, hear, don't create. Movies don't create psychos. Movies make psychos more creative. <laughs> yeah. Like even like my recent stuff, I don't have any I haven't written swear words in a lot of my recent scripts at all. I just haven't had a need to like say F U F that like I did before like I had before. Like 
Huh. I have to, a lot of the cast ask me now. They're like, "Can I swear in this part?" Like they ask me if they can swear. I'm thinking, yeah, it's fine for this. Let's go ahead. But I don't like. I feel like it, I feel like it. this calls for an F word. What do you think? Yeah, they can feel it. Feel I'm feeling my character would say fuck at this moment. <laughs> but like for Air Fryer, I wasn't too like worried about it. But for Nightmares Unleashed, we did it where because it's the fantasy horror. There's no need for swearing. I think we called uh, we used the word bitch once, but I didn't want to use any f bombs. Um, but also doing it that way, I think I let one actor drop one f bomb. But the way we shot nightmares is we have an R rated cut with a nude scene, and then we actually did a PG thirteen cut where we cut the camera above the boobs, so you actually don't see anything. That way, we can have a PG thirteen cut for the um, kids who were in the film and an R rated cut that we can show elsewhere like different festivals might want the not r-rated cut but they want a pg-13 cut so we shot it in a way where we can have two different versions of the film now nice very well. planning ahead and going yeah. back to, to what you said about fnaf is like yeah the five nights at freddy movie is kind of like come on willie's wonderland was the five nights at freddy movie that we yeah basically that one i'd yeah. rather watch willie's wonderland any day than the five nights at freddy's film any um, day yeah and it, it's it's awesome because the story behind that, and, and I imagine, was is kind of similar to the experiences that you had because when they were filming that, the pandemic hit and everything went on lockdown. And so at the abandoned bowling alley, the derelict bowling alley they were shooting at, where they converted half of it into the into the into the, the pizza place, and the other half was you know kind of like production area. They had to turn that into quarters because when they when the lockdowns hit, nobody could leave. So Nick Cage. The entire cast and all the crew were all living in that space for like three months while they were stuck. They were stuck there. Nobody could go anywhere. And they, they said apparently it was awesome. It was like, you know, it was like it wasn't overbearing. Nick Cage was just awesome, you know, and you know, it was just kind of cool to be there in that kind of be there in that situation. I but mean, yeah, yeah Nick, the, Nick Cage did get his paycheck for that, too. That's, that's <laughs> another, he got his paycheck for but yeah, the the remakes, reboots, and and I say this while Week in Horror has a reboot like on the burner as we speak, and so I say this. But you, I like how you pointed out that there's a point when it it can be done and it's justified being done. You know, if it if the if something is old and deserves a retelling or a kind of like something new to bring to a new generation yeah. or to kind of reflect that, very similar to Maniac. With, you know, the Maniac that came out in 1980, you know, the Spinell uh, version. Then, of course, you got the Elijah Wood version that I uh, brought out. And they're like, that, it was fucking amazing. What a way to retell that story. To tell the oh, same yeah. story, but kind of tell it in a new way. And yeah, I and love that. But just cap trying to capitalize on smashing that fucking nostalgia button. Yeah, like, like Black oh, Xmas. nostalgia. <laughs> it just drives me insane. They they have, they already remade Black Xmas twice. Hopefully they don't make that one again. Because oh, that new one. Uh, was, the, they, I don't even want to get into that. That was how did it get work. worse? How did it get worse than the than the than the one with Michelle Trachtenberg? How do you go lower than that? I and it was like <laughs> a lot of the stuff. It's just like again, you need horror elements. You can't just make this crap not horror. I even seen a film recently that had the uh, fake blood splatter, and I'm thinking, why is the actor not bloody after just killing someone? I just cannot stand that. Like the Evil Dead Rise film, at least there was blood on the actors. They got bloody. But like you got other film, like even indie films, they have. I watched an indie film. There's someone's killing someone. Next scene, they have no blood on them. It was all fake blood. It's like, why even do it then? I mean, if you're not going to have the characters get bloody. First off, they don't want to get bloody. Find a new actor because it's a horror film. Right. Like all my casting calls, it's like you will get bloody. Just know that. You know, if you don't want to get bloody, don't do this role. And first three, like, first three rows will get wet. Yeah, yeah. It's like <laughs> I'm not gonna even like, not even like me. I get blood on my hands every shoot. Even though we, even if I'd even like spray blood on myself, I just end up getting bloody. Like even if we don't use blood, because I have like my camera still has blood stains on it. My tripod has blood stains on it. I haven't cleaned a lot of it off. I just leave it. Like the camcorder has some blood stains on it from air fryer slaughter that we splattered on an accident. So again, it's just like. If you're going to use blood, just actually use blood. I mean, it's not hard to do. You get a little CPAP tube, fill it up with blood, squirt it out. There's an there's a blood shot. It takes a few seconds. The blood, you can get you need to get that $20 cheap kind of blood. Or we use Ben Nay $50 blood. That's like 
mouth proof so you could spew it out of your mouth. It comes off all of the fabrics of clothing, so if it get bloody, actors can wash their clothes and it looks like nothing happened. So it's just just spend a little bit on the good blood, or if not, then just bloody something up that you can don't care about. Buy a shirt from Goodwill or something. Who cares? Well, we have a we we have a saying here at Week in Horror when we're talking about the movies that we talk about every single week, and is that we always wish that the industry would re would remake bad films because we have covered we're coming up on over a thousand films that we've covered on the show. And we come across so many films that had really solid premises, but the execution was just abysmal, whatever it may be studio interference or lack of budget, you know, budgetary constraints or problems behind the, the myriad shit that, that we have dealt with before in the past, you, cause you never know what's going to happen when you get on set, you get on set, you have a plan, then shit happens and you, and you, you know, it happens all the time. And we always talk about that. And so we always like say like that, that movie should be remade. Don't fucking touch that one. That's no, that's not necessary in your eyes. What do you have? Do you have a film that you think should be remade that no one has? No, no, if, no one has considered yet. If I could personally remake it myself, because I think I can make the film with how I make movies with like the child actors and like the, uh, practical effects and monsters and stuff again if i had the rights to it to remake any horror film i would do the willies from 1990 just because it's like my favorite film and i think it could really be used for a new generation i would try to just advance some of the stuff they did like i'd still keep poodle in a microwave but maybe change the dog to something um but again or like you could redo Attack of the Killer Tomatoes if you really wanted to make it gory too. I mean, you get even if you want to do like actual real tomatoes, you could throw on a fake CGI face on them. You know, I'm not too worried about that. That might be better than just throwing googly eyes on a tomato. But, um, I mean, I'm excited for the Street Trash one because I think Street Trash could be better than what it is. Um. Because I'm really excited to see what they do to Street Trash. I think they're doing it on video again, too, which is really a neat idea. Um, maybe. No, no. Maybe, <laughs> I know when the Puppet Master reboot was really good when um, I forgot what company did it, but that one was really good. The Puppet Master one maybe like redo a chud, but make it more. Oh, that would be a cool one because. I mean, the way they got sets, they can totally like the Jim Henson company. I think we're doing the um, Five Nights at Freddy stuff. It's not hard to make a chud outfit with like a moving chud, like full on chud looking monster with the sewers and just extend that a little bit. But and what we can pull off today with what they physically can do with like, you know, the stretchy shit and they like that. I mean, with what we can with what can be pulled off today with practical effects compared to you know back then, oh, I think yeah, easily, that would be an yeah. amazing remake. As, as long as it was kept practical, yeah. As long it, as you, you could do that, yeah. A lot of the stuff I like eighty style. If they bring it a reboot and it's not practical at all, it just like it takes me out of watching it. It's like I rather just I want to see something. I don't want to see a CGI chud if it was a thing. It's not hard <laughs> to get a guy that you can get like um. Not the Doug Jones, but the guy who played that vampire in the um uh Javier Botet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. he has the built for like creature suits too. You can get him in something. Um, his height and his arms. I mean, that's a creepy chud walking to you. Also, put him in outfits and stuff. And then, like, I think a lot of sync cast films would be cool to see again. Like. No, I can't say that, actually. I'm going to cut that. Yeah, I don't want to say that. I don't even want to say the two films I was thinking of because I know they'd ruin Basket Case and Brain Damage. <laughs> you can't do better than that. But, um, I mean, it's just hard because a lot... Of, like, I know they're still, still making new Saw films, which is, like, crazy <laughs> that they're still doing Saws. Final Destination's coming back out with another one, too, right. which is crazy. It's just... It kind of blew my mind. They kind of blew my mind. Saw X... Actually, I was like, because I saw it, I saw, yeah, I saw, I watched, I saw, saw, but I watched them up until, you know, I saw like, I, I, up until like, you know, nine and I was or up until eight and I was like, uh, and then I saw Spiral and I was like, okay, 
Uh, yeah, all, all right. Yeah. You know, um, you mid, you know, middling. Okay. Chris Rock is cool. I didn't know that Chris Rock was a was a Saw super fan. But then Saw X came out, and I was like, damn, that was actually pretty good. It was a hell of a lot better than I anticipated. It was like, is this? are we going to see a resurgence? Apparently, because we got another one coming out this year. So <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like Saw 8, to me, the Jigsaw one, it felt way more comedy Saw to me than horror Saw. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it's like, I don't like the Jigsaw one. As, like, number 8, I think it's way too comedic for the horror. But when Saw 10 came out, I'm thinking... This is really, I like this. You know, I like the gores and stuff. So I hope they do more stuff like that for the next one, too. And again, them traps aren't CGI either. Because, I mean, you got to make the traps, which is sweet. I wasn't Um, so much on board with the whole, like, you know, Tobin Bell with the backwards cap. Hey, kids. How are you doing? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, hey, hip kids, what's happening? I did, you know, trying to like, you know, it was like, Make hey, it's been younger, 90s. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I mean, okay. A, that, man, that man's a treasure, though, Tobin Bell. He's oh, he's a, a national treasure. And one of my favorite acting, ones. Uh, one of my favorite ones is him and, Lin, is, him and Lynn Shea together. Fuck, yeah, I mean, that, that too. Those two together just commanding. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, his, like, Saw 10, his normal acting is, like, really good in that one. Like he's a good actor outside like the horror stuff that people like I know he played um he was in like a Skelter Helters type of thing, I know. And he was really good in that one too, acting wise. He was uh there was a um there was a movie, uh what was it? Uh Tobin Bell and Lin Shay, The Call. We're about a, a bunch of kids breaking into a house, and you know, Lynch is the way you know, it's owned by uh, this this old couple, uh, Tobin Bell and and Lynch, played by Tobin Bell and Lynch. And it, it was a rare opportunity to see Tobin really go you know, really express himself as an actor because we get to see him not only as like an antagonist, you know, because he, you know, he plays a, such a phenomenal antagonist, but also. In the in the moments between him and Lynch to see the vulnerable side, see that yes, this man is extraordinarily talented. Look at him go like, I'm the bad guy. And then in these moments, look, I, I'm a vulnerable husband and this is my wife and she is dying and sick. And see these moments. I love that, you know, I love that we get those little moments when filmmakers, when we, get pro, when we get projects that allow actors to showcase why they are as talented as they are. It's like, it's like this is why they are, are who they are. You know, I, I, that's, what I, that's what I want. I want to be able to see that stuff, which is always so cool. All right. So, given how many things that you have in pre-production, which looking at this is just, I I don't know when you sleep. I swear to God, man, it's like, wh- wh- like this is like twenty things in pre-production in various stages of production. This is this is nuts. I'm so glad that you have a dedicated team behind you. Yeah, I mean, it's I got the dedicated team, and then of course, family, parents are always behind it, but. I know a lot of like the um, upcoming stuff is like um, stuff I've written. I just like I know gum. I had an idea for that back in 2017 and I just wrote a small part for it, but we never actually had done anything with it. So like a couple of them I have full length scripts for already. And they're written. I just don't have any time to film. them, So they're just going to stay in pre-production for like a while longer. Mm-hmm. Um but a lot of the stuff is I'm trying to pump out what I can when I can. I love that you got it that you got it all there. It, that those of those he's like my there's like yeah we got this we got all these ideas that are churning and they are in various stages we're going to get them done. That's that dedication that I wish that I think the industry itself could take a fucking lesson from is like look original ideas while often tough to come by or trying to do something and make it your own is it should be the standard. Not just rehashing shit to punch on people's nostalgia buttons, you know, in order to try and make as much money as possible for as less expenditure. And it's just, it's just, come on, do the work. You here, sir, are doing the work and making the genre all the better for it. You know, I absolutely, I I fucking love it. It's amazing. Please tell us, please tell the listeners where we can find all of your stuff, where they can watch all your cool stuff, wherever it might might be. Plug, Plug yourself away, sir. Um, 10 films of ours are on Troma Now streaming. You can just type in Matthew Mark Connor and all 10 films I was a part of that I made will come up. Um, those are a lot of those are ones that aren't available on YouTube to watch for free. Um, they're either streaming or on, they're on DVD. 
MMH Productions on YouTube is your go-to spot for all our um, comedy horror shirt shorts um, stuff. I do every like we shoot something in a weekend, be done with it. It might not be the best quality, but it's still a, a horror film. Um, so we have those on YouTube. Um, if you reach out to me on Facebook or Instagram, Matthew Mark Hunter, I can send you an eBay link. Um, and you could buy the films that aren't on YouTube that are on DVD only um, from eBay. We have like combo packs where it's like get 10 shorts in this one bundle. We have the feature films on DVD. Uh, we're always bringing out new stuff for that one. Um, and that's really it. We have MMH Productions on YouTube. And then Wonderful World Show is also on YouTube, which is my kids channel. Um, so if you have like kids who like just watching kids stuff that's available with that also or if you just want to see my two sides my gemini life horror and kids you can do that too but mmh productions on youtube is the go-to spot that is awesome that is awesome well matthew i know that you are super busy and you have got tons of shit going on and we have this has been an amazing discussion but i know i gotta let you go so i appreciate you so much taking time out to come back, to come back and return to Week in Horror and talk with us about, you know, what's transpired the last, you know, almost five years, like four, like four and a half years since we last chatted. It's been absolutely amazing. Thank you very, very much, man. This was an, an absolute blast. Oh, yeah. Thank you again for having me. And I know um, when you guys see this, we'll have an in-demand still for the Air Fryer Slaughter on Indiegogo. Yes. And it's going to be in-demand for like a few more months. Um, so... Of course, things are going to be going away as time goes by, but by time, sometimes like you'll still be able to get DVDs and things like in like screen news outfits and body parts on Indiegogo the whole time as long as they're available. But for sure, if you have every time or then or ask me and I can hook you up with some stuff, too. Nice. Awesome, man. How fucking cool is this? He started out. He started out punching out shorts every single week, and now he's fucking directing Lloyd Kaufman. Congratulations, Matthew, and all the success. We we are, we are going to follow you and see your meteoric rise to the top of the horror genre. So well, well done. Thank you again so very, very much. And to all of you listeners out there, remember this is this front row is done every single month. We bring on these industry guests to hang out with us and talk about their careers and the industry itself, and all the dish on all the juicy details, all the the bloody gooey details of what goes on when we are making this genre the best one it possibly is. If you want more from Matthew Mark Hunter, we're going to put all the links, every single one of them, down in the description. You can follow all of his stuff, follow him on the socials. You can check out all of his content on his YouTube channel and check out his webpage so you can check, see all the cool stuff that he's got. Not to mention his IMDb so you can see all his upcoming stuff as well. It'll all be there. You can go and follow along and follow his rise and his just conquering of the horror genre right there in the description. So I want to thank each and every single one of you for joining us for this especially this amazing front row. Every single month we do this, so we hope to see you in the next one. If you'd like to support the channel, you can at patreon.com slash weekendhorror, where you can get early access to all of these special interviews that we do with these amazing professionals. Thank you once again, Matthew. You rock, dude. You know, thank and hopefully you. it won't be, and hopefully it won't be another, you know, like almost five years before you're on the show again. Cool? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's good. That sounds real good. All right, but stay busy. Thank you so much for joining us. I have been JL, and as always, stay scared.